Votes are expected throughout the day. And now to live house coverage here on C-SPAN. The House will be in order. A prayer will be offered by our chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. Bless the members of this assembly as they set upon the work of these hours of these days. Help them to make wise decisions in a good manner and to carry their responsibilities steadily with high hopes for a better future for our great nation. Deepen their faith, widen their sympathies, heighten their aspirations, and give them the strength to, to do what ought to be done for this country. May your blessing, O God, be with them and with us all this day and every day to come and may all we do be done for your greater honor and glory. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. And pursuant to clause one of rule one, the journal stands approved. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Bouchon. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to 15 uh, requests on each side for one-minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? Without objections to order. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor U.S. Army Specialist James A. Waters. Specialist Waters, a 21-year-old native of Cloverdale, Indiana, lost his life in combat on July 1st in Kandahar, Afghanistan, of wounds suffered from an improvised explosive device during an insurgent attack. Specialist Waters was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 32nd Infantry Regiment, 3rd Brigade Combat Team, 10th Mountain Division in Fort Drum, New York. Indiana lost a great citizen whom was affectionately known as Jimmy. He planned to marry his high school sweetheart in December. His sacrifice and valor should be commended, and I would like to offer my most heartfelt condolences to Specialist Waters' family and friends. From a grateful nation, he will be missed but not forgotten. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. What purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to applaud the work of the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Preventive Services for Women, who released their critically important final report yesterday. The IOM's recommendations are clear. Women need access to annual well woman preventive visits, access to screenings for domestic violence, gestational diabetes, and a full range of sexually transmitted diseases. They need to have increased breastfeeding support and they need to have access to contraceptives, all without cost sharing. In these hard economic times, these recommendations underscore the imperative that women and their families should not have to choose between preventive care and paying their bills. The IOM was bold. It broke through the extreme politics surrounding women's health and instead relies on rigorous science to make its determinations. We must follow the IOM's lead and ensure all women have access to these services no matter where they get their health care or how much they earn. I yield back the balance of my time. Utah rise. Without objection. Gang of six? A gang of six? How about that gang of 234 people yesterday, Republicans and Democrats, who passed a plan that doesn't raise taxes and averts the crisis? I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? Without objection. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of the extraordinary work of the Rhode Island Council of Community Mental Health Organizations. Representatives from the Rhode Island Council of Community Mental Health Organizations are on Capitol Hill this week advocating for the millions of Americans who suffer from mental illness. The Council's work is vital because according to the National Institute of Mental Health, an estimated 26% of American adults will suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year and approximately 6% of Americans will suffer from a serious form of mental illness. Since 1979, the Council has led critical efforts to raise awareness about mental health and emphasize the importance of mental health care funding. The Council's efforts to integrate behavioral health with primary care has saved lives, cut costs in our state, setting example for the nation. The Rhode Island Council of Community Mental Health Organizations is a true leader in the field of mental health. I believe we must make mental health care and full implementation of mental health parity a major priority as we continue to protect health care as a right for all. I commend the Rhode Island Council of Community Mental Health Organizations on their work to improve and promote mental health care. I yield back the balance of my time. What purpose the gentleman from Colorado rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise before you to recognize the hard work and dedication of Archbishop Charles Chaput, who has served the Colorado Catholic community for over a decade. It was announced this week that he has been reassigned to lead the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. While I am saddened that Archbishop Chapu will be leaving our great state, he leaves behind a legacy of defending the innocent and helping the weak that we can all celebrate with pride. He first came to Colorado in 1977 to be pastor of Holy Cross Parish in Thornton. After many years of ministry and having held various important positions in the church in 1997, Pope John Paul II appointed and installed him Archbishop of Denver. He has fought against anti-Semitism and other forms of intolerance, working tirelessly to advance religious freedom around the globe. His outreach to the Hispanic community is second to none. I first met him at the Colorado State Legislature, where I learned him, uh, became, came to know him as a man of high integrity and deep, deep faith. I admire the Archbishop's dedication to all people of faith. I'd like to offer him my most sincere thanks for all of his work in Colorado and wish him the best of luck in all of his future endeavors. I yield back. What purpose the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, Republicans want deep spending cuts with no new revenues as the price of raising the debt limit. Some Republicans have downplayed the impact that defaulting on the national debt would have on our economy and our people. And most Republicans have downplayed the impact on average Americans of the budget cuts they're calling for. This doesn't come as a surprise, but what is surprising is how out of touch they are with mainstream Americans. Most Americans say their biggest concern isn't government spending, it's jobs. But rather than pursue a real job creation agenda, House Republicans have passed legislation that would actually slow the economy and kill American jobs. Their demand for even bigger spending cuts in exchange for raising the debt ceiling is the latest and greatest effort yet to kill middle-class American jobs. They see either we cut government spending deeper or they're going to force us into default, which every economist agrees causes a deeper recession and throws hundreds of thousands of middle-class Americans out of work. Mr. Speaker, it's time for House Republicans to get a grip and offer an agenda that actually creates jobs. What purpose the gentleman from Mississippi rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, 42 years ago today, Neil Armstrong took one, one small step on the lunar surface. It was the culmination of a national initiative to put men on the moon. But although our mission was achieved, it didn't end our yearning to explore. In many ways, it only deepened, and I believe it still exists today. Tomorrow, STS-135 Atlantis is scheduled to land in Florida, and with the completion of the mission, the shuttle program will have come to an end. Uh, we now face the uncertainty of where our next steps in space will be. America's legacy is the unrivaled world leader in space exploration enters into a new and uncertain era. As chairman of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, partnered with Chairman Ralph Hall, I will work within Congress, with NASA, and with private entities to ensure America's space exploration legacy is maintained and that last year's NASA reauthorization bill is implemented. We must continue developing the Space Launch System and multi-purpose crew vehicle in order to achieve assured access for American crews to the International Space Station. Even in challenging economic times, I urge my colleagues to prioritize human spaceflight, for it is in times like this that inspiration is needed more than ever.
I yield. For the purpose, the gentleman from Tennessee, rise. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Republican slash and burn politics have not created a single job for hardworking Americans, and they ha the Republicans have not presented a bill on jobs in this Congress. The fact is, we need jobs, and we need innovative jobs, and the Democrats have proposed a jobs plan that emphasizes innovation. We had an opportunity last week to have more investment in solar, less in fossil fuels. Solar green jobs that are innovative create more jobs and protect us in the future so we have, don't have to spend money on defense to protect those lines that bring us oil from the Middle East. Yet we didn't do it. We need to invest in education, and the Democrats have tried to do that, but the Republicans want to cut Pell Grants and cut workforce investment opportunities. We need to have an educated workforce, and we need to have creative ways to create jobs and not just be slaving to big oil and Wall Street. Jobs is our most important business here, and while I speak of jobs, we have one job the American public wants us to do, and that's prevent a default on our debt and embarrass the United States and wreck the world's economy. That's more important than any pledge, Mr. Speaker, that anybody's taken. Don't default. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. General from Pennsylvania, rise. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the House passed the cut cap balance plan to control government spending and raise the debt limit. Now we need the Senate to act and put their plan on the table. While it was good to hear yesterday that at least six senators have reached an agreement on a plan to control our debt, what we really need is the other chamber to bring a plan to the floor and pass it out of the Senate. We have passed a clear plan, one that can be scored by the CBO, a plan that calls for a long-term solution to keep Congress responsible, the balanced budget amendment. It is clear that we need to act on the debt ceiling soon. Our credit rating is certainly at risk. However, we cannot forget that what is truly at risk is the long-term solvency of our nation. If we continue on the current path, we will end up being controlled by our creditors, just like Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. Our very independence is at stake here. By acting responsibly now, we avoid greater pain later. Kicking the can down the road is only kicking our nation's future. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, unless this Congress takes action on August 2nd, our nation will stop paying our bills because we refuse to come together and take shared responsibility. These bills pay for policies already purchased, such as the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the 2003 prescription drug benefit, tax cuts, and emergency measures to save our economy. Yesterday, House Republicans passed a bill that asked for sacrifices from seniors, veterans, and children, but exempted corporations from giving up even their most egregious tax loopholes, like those that encourage shipping jobs overseas. That bill also all but guarantees a default by requiring a two-thirds vote from both chambers before we can pay our bills. To return to the balanced budgets of the 1990s will require a long-term commitment from the entire country, a commitment that will only come if everyone contributes. We do not need to end Social Security and Medicare, as some would do. We can and must reduce the deficit in a balanced way that ensures the well-being of every American. Thank you. What purpose, the gentleman from the Northern Mariana Islands? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, 20 years ago, one of the most significant and enduring community groups in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands was formed, the Northern Mariana Islands Council for the Humanities. Since its founding, the Council has become a well-respected community-based organization committed to fostering awareness, understanding, and appreciation of the humanities in the Northern Mariana Islands through its support of educational programs that relate the humanities to the indigenous cultures and intellectual needs and interests of the people of the Commonwealth. The Northern Mariana Islands Council for the Humanities has enhanced the lives of our residents as individuals and enhanced our community as a whole. The Council's Board of Directors is and, has, and always has been extraordinarily passionate and successful in setting and achieving goals that benefit our diverse and remote community. The Council's achievements belie our modest population and resources. Please join me in congratulating the Northern Man Islands Council for the Humanities on its 20th anniversary of serving the Commonwealth of the Northern Man Islands community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we need bipartisan efforts that focus on fiscal responsibility while maintaining important investments in our communities that will create jobs and grow the economy. Even now, I am trying to be confident that the best interests of the American people will prevail. But it is terribly disappointing that ending Medicare for seniors is so important to Republicans that they continue to pursue this agenda at all costs and willingly put our national economy in peril. Mr. Speaker, the House of Representatives has been under control of Republicans for nearly 200 days, and they have yet to bring a single job-creating bill to the floor. This is an issue that should always be above partisan politics. It seems that they would rather see the United States default on its existing debt for the first time in history, watch our economy lose hundreds of thousands of jobs, and cause interest rates and consumer goods and prices to skyrocket in the process. We must do something about it. Thank you, and I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Maryland rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today because I look across my congressional district and across this country where people have lost their homes, they've lost their jobs, uh, they've sacrificed their retirement accounts because the, our fiscal house hasn't been in order. And here today we sit uh, awaiting the opportunity to do for the American people what we ought to, which is uh, to prevent a default. Uh, to pre prevent a default that would result in uh, further sacrificing of retirement savings and, and jobs and homes across this country. They're really depending on us. And I rise today, Mr. Speaker, to say that we have an important responsibility to our seniors to protect their Medicare and their Social Security benefits, to make sure that we're creating opportunities for education for their, uh, their children, to make sure that we're creating jobs, rebuilding our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our, our highways, um, our rail system. And we haven't done our job. And so, Mr. Speaker, I say it's time for us to stop the silliness, uh, to prevent a default, and to get on with the nation's business. And with that, I yield. What purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I rise today to say what my colleagues and I'm sure many Americans across the country are saying. Stop playing the games and get the work done. I understand we all come here with values, ideas, principles that we, uh, that we hold dear, but when the facts dispute our ideology, we don't get the choice to change the facts. You change your ideology. Failure to pay our bills will be catastrophic to our economy. It's that simple. This isn't a question of enabling future deficits. The federal government needs to cover promises it made to our soldiers, to our veterans, to our seniors, and to our creditors. Responsible people and countries pay their bills. Our 40th president knew this. In a radio address he delivered in 1987, Ronald Reagan admonished Congress for, not, for bringing the government to the edge of default and urged them to face their responsibility. Here's what President Reagan said. Interest rates will skyrocket. Instability will occur in the financial markets, and the federal deficit will soar. Let me repeat that. The federal deficit would soar. We cannot ignore the facts, and allowing our nation to default no way fixes our budget problems. Stop playing the games. Get the work done. Move the country forward. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from New Mexico rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of important conversations that are taking place today, but it's important that we talk about what's happened in New Mexico recently. New Mexico has been hit by a series of wildfires during this extremely dry fire season. Many communities have been threatened by fires as families have lost their homes and livestock and tribal lands have been damaged. At a time when many counties are struggling with the drought, the fire damage to our watersheds, which provides New Mexico the majority of its surface water, has impacted drinking water supplies and increased the threat of floods during monsoon season. With the Midwest recovering from floods and tornadoes and the West battling fires and drought, the current resources available to fight these disasters are simply not enough. Funds for the Natural Resource Conservation Services Emergency Watershed Protection Program, which assists with the protection of watersheds that have been impacted by natural disasters, have almost been depleted as a result of the disasters around the country. It's vital that we provide more resources for this critical program that can strengthen watersheds affected by the combination of fire, damage, high temperature, and lack of rainfall. 
I encourage my colleagues to support efforts to address funding shortfalls to the Emergency Watershed Protection Program so we can help our communities recover. What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to ask my colleagues to join me in recognizing the contributions of the Warrior Watch Riders, a troop support group for their commitment to our veterans, their families, and our community. Rain or shine, the Warriors Watch Riders in my district provide a motorcycle escort to our service members and welcome them home as they return back to our community. When one of our service members makes the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty, the Warriors Watch Riders recognize their sacrifice, honor their memory, and offer support to their families. I've seen firsthand how the Warrior Watch Riders bring communities together with the roar of their motorcycles. Bonds are built, tears are shed, and families, friends, and neighbors come together with the Warriors Watch Riders to show respect for the sacrifices those in uniform make to ensure our freedom. I ask my colleagues to join me in recognizing the Warrior Watch Riders for all they do for the men and women who serve our country. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Illinois rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, the Republican bill cuts caps and balances all right, cuts Medicare, caps Medicaid, and balances the budget on the back of our seniors, people with disabilities, and the middle class. When Willie Sutton was asked why do you rob banks, he said, because that's where the money is. Asking the elderly and people with disabilities to shoulder the responsibility for our national debt, really? Nearly half of Medicare beneficiaries have incomes at or below 200% of poverty. The median income for our seniors is just over $19,000 a year. The Republican proposals will end the Medicare guarantee, double out-of-pocket costs for seniors and people with disabilities, and send them an invoice for $6,000. Of course we need to address our fiscal challenges, but not by ending Medicare in the process. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection. Yesterday, our Republican friends jumped for joy when they passed a draconian bill that would cut $6 trillion and, of course, jeopardize a lifeline for millions of Americans, and that is Social Security. We've all been referring to a president that is endeared by this whole country. President Reagan, in his letter uh, to Senator Baker, said, the nation can ill afford to allow such a result. The risks, the costs, the disruptions, and the incalculable damage lead me to but one conclusion. The Senate must vote to raise the debt ceiling in 1983 when the country was much smaller. But what do we face here? Frivolous activity like Republican freshmen who are in their manner of efforts show the disrespect for the office of the presidency. One member said, I have a challenge for the president. I dare him. I double dare him to even think about cutting Social Security. Well, you've just cut Social Security as a Republican freshman, and I would ask you to respect the office of the presidency. Why don't we engage in negotiation, work together as a nation, as the American people want? I'd like a little more respect from my colleagues for the President of the United States, President Barack Obama. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last night we voted once again in the House of Representatives to cut Medicare, to cut Social Security, and to reward the wealthiest 2% of our nation with tax cuts and, of course, big business with tax cuts. The Republican majority wasted a crucial day of debate instead of protecting and working on the financial security for our nation. We could have debated a strong jobs agenda like the Make It in America agenda the Democrats had. We could have discussed how we can strengthen partnerships with businesses to retain America's workers for the jobs that are actually needed here. But what did they do? As one former Republican budget advisor called it, they debated something that was, and I quote, a misleading political cheap shot. The Republicans' Cut, Cap, and Balance Act is harmful for this country, and it's not a serious proposal. It's not going to be signed into law. They wasted our time. So I am glad that that bill 
is dead on arrival in the Senate, but I really wish, I really wish they would get down to working for America. And I yield back, Mr. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 357 and ask for immediate consideration. Clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 54, House Resolution 357, resolved <coughs> that upon the adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order to consider in the House the bill H.R. 2553 to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to extend the funding and expenditure authority of the Airport and Airway Trust Fund to amend Title 49 United States Code to extend the Airport Improvement Program and for other purposes. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. The bill shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in the bill are waived. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill to final passage without intervening motion except one, one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the Chair and Ranking Minority Member of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and two, one motion to recommit. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for one hour. Mr. Speaker, uh, for the purpose of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to my good friend, Mr. Hastings from Florida, uh, pending uh, which I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. During, during consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for purpose of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members uh, have five legislative days to revise or extend their remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to support this rule and the underlying bill. Uh, House Resolution 357 provides for a closed rule for consideration of H.R. 2553, Airport and Airway Extension Act of 2011, Part 4. Uh, so far in the 112th Congress, three short-term extensions have been signed into law to allow for the continued Aviation Trust Fund revenue collections and aviation program authority necessary to operate America's airports. Uh, the latest short-term extension uh, expires this Friday, uh, the 22nd. H.R. 2553 would extend the program for a little less than two months to September 16th. The bill maintains current funding levels for FFA, its employees, its, and the airports around the country. The bill also includes two simple essential air service, EAS, uh, reform provisions, one of which has already passed the Senate by unanimous consent. Both the House and Senate have passed separate versions of multi-year reauthorization bills, so this short-term extension will hopefully give the House and Senate the time needed to work out the differences between the two bills so that we can stop just kicking the can down the road. And to say that, that's exactly what we're doing. For starters, 21 extensions of the FAA program since the last reauthorization. We've, we've been at this exact juncture 20 other times. Last reauthorization shepherded by Chairman Michael was over seven and a half years ago. That's a long time. Since uh, September 30th, 2007, the FAA has been operating on a series of short-term stopgap extensions. Quite simply, <clears throat> it's just time to stop doing this. It's too much. Uh, safety of our airline passengers, and, uh, and, and we ought to take that in consideration and pass a necessary and meaningful long-term FAA reauthorization. Once again, Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this rule and the underlying legislation. The Transportation Infrastructure Committee has worked to provide us yet another short-term extension, which will ensure that the continued safety of airline passengers with the hope that the Senate and the House can finally come to the table and realize a long-term reauthorization. I encourage my colleagues to vote yes on the rule and yes on the underlying bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Chairman from Florida. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, and I thank my good friend from Florida for yielding of, of the time. Mr. Speaker, the Airport and Airway Extension Act of 2011, uh, Part 4, extends aviation trust fund revenue collections and aviation program authority at current funding levels through September 16th of this year, while also imposing new restrictions on the essential air service uh, program. Frankly, it's no su substitute for a long-term Federal Aviation Administration authorization and casts further doubt 
on airport construction and safety improvements instead of ensuring air passenger safety, creating jobs, or investing in air traffic control modernization. As I'm sure most Americans would agree, the word uncertain does not belong in a conversation about our nation's aviation system. And it certainly does not belong in the same sentence as air passenger safety. Um, I know a friend in the house who is a pilot uh, agrees with that statement. Over the course of almost four years, however, great uncertainty surrounding long-term funding for the FAA has threatened and continues to threaten both. Without steady funding, the FAA is unable to best manage the long-term programs and projects that are vital to the future of our aviation system, including life-saving airport safety improvements and the transition uh, to the very important next-generation air transportation system that we know as NextGen. Make no mistake, the United States has the safest, most efficient aviation system in the world. We can all thank our highly skilled, dedicated aviation uh, professionals uh, for that. But in order to ensure that it remains that way, we must stop kicking the FAA reauthorization can further down the road. I know these cans around here get tired of being kicked around the road, down the road. The measure before us is the 21st short-term FAA extension to be considered since the last FAA authorization bill, Vision um, 100, expired at the end of September 2007. I repeat, this is the 21st short-term FAA extension we have considered in less than four years. It is also the sixth extension of Operation Authority for fiscal year 2011. Meanwhile, there's been no progress for weeks on a long-term authorization. While short-term extensions have their place in the legislative process, they should be the exception, not the rule, especially when authorizing the important safety and modernization activities of the FAA. The extension not only fails to address the long-term aviation needs of our nation, but also denies many of our small and rural communities the air service and economic opportunities made possible by the essential air service uh, program. By including these policy riders, House Republicans risk a shutdown of our aviation system. And Senator Rockefeller, after our Rules Committee meeting last night, made that very clear in a letter from him uh, to Chairman uh, Micah. Instead of appointing conferees, as the Senate did 100 days ago, House Republicans seem to be pointing fingers and effectively forcing a vote on the future of the ESA program ahead of conference legislation. While House Republicans continue to play the blame game with the Senate, American businesses and workers are losing out on much needed economic opportunities. Aviation, as we all know, is an economic engine for the United States, contributing $1.3 trillion to our economy accounting for more than 11 and a half million jobs and $396 billion in earnings and contributing 5.6% to our nation's gross domestic product. Without full year funding for the FAA, local officials are unable to move forward with project proposals. Because of this, the FAA is an estimated $800 million to $1 billion behind in obligating funding, which translates to tens of thousands of jobs. Furthermore, if the FAA is unable to utilize these funds before the end of the fiscal year, they risk being reprogrammed or rescinded. 
This, in my view, is irresponsible, dangerous, and unacceptable. The FAA will have to do more with less, which reduces its ability to help airports finance, finance safety improvements such, such as special runway overshoot areas, runway resurfacing, proper signage, and lighting, and equipment to prevent snow and ice buildup on runways. These measures not only save lives, but increase efficiency at a time when air traffic is projected to continue growing significantly. According to the FAA, the number of passengers on U.S. airlines is forecasted to increase by about 75 percent within the next 20 years and to reach 1 billion passengers annually within the next decade. We must invest more in our aviation system, not less. Long-term FAA authorization should be an immediate priority. In the 110th and 111th Congresses, the House under Democratic leadership passed FAA reauthorization bills that would have created jobs, improved aviation safety, and provided the FAA with the tools necessary to modernize airport and air traffic control infrastructure. My friends on the other side should do the responsible thing and appoint conferees so that the House and Senate can work out their differences and finalize a long-term FAA reauthorization bill. Unfortunately, my friends on the other side of the aisle are clearly preoccupied with further isolating small and rural communities than moving this debate forward. In fact, the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee has held no hearings specifically on the EAS program this year, nor did they hold markup on the measure before us. Or the Senate is not going to pass this, and I won't place the letter in, um, uh, to the record, uh, but Senator Rockefeller makes it very clear as the chair of, of, of the relevant committee in the Senate, that this is not going um, uh, to pass in the, its form with the policy riders attached. Um, yet, without the ability to offer amendments on the floor, as I requested in the Rules Committee last night, uh, to consider a clean extension, one free of uh, the policy riders that will hurt our small and rural communities, we face a shutdown, I believe, my good friend from Florida, Mr. Webster, said on Friday uh, this short-term extension would expire and then our aviation system uh, stands uh, to shut, uh, shut down. Uh, that would be most unfortunate. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Petrak. I thank my colleague for yielding, and I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues on the Rules Committee for so expeditiously uh, uh, bringing up this rule for consideration this afternoon of uh, the, I think it's over two, second, 24th extension of the uh, a temporary extension of the reauthorization of the uh, FAA legislation. Uh, you know, this, this reauthorization has been held hostage for several years, and it is not cost-free. It's interfering with the efficiency of operations, the ability to plan and to uh, expend uh, funds on needed airport improvements all across the country. So we're paying a price for this sort of thing, and I really don't think we should be allowing people to... Uh, assert that they have the right uh, unilaterally to hold up the whole process, that it's their way or the highway, especially when what we're doing in this particular mild change to reform a needed uh, part of this legislation, uh, essential air service, which is badly needed reform, is basically acceding to a language that's already in the Senate bill. Uh, and then if that, if, by agreeing to the bill that's 
uh, in this respect to pass the other house, this is non-negotiable that we can, can re be so, so uh, uh, bold as to simply say, fine, we'll agree to the language that you have, which, which basically provides that, that if uh, uh, an airport is within 90 miles of a, uh, of a major airport, it's not eligible for essential air service. The other provides that uh, the uh, cap on subsidy from the federal government would be $1,000 per passenger. Uh, now, we're what are we talking about? We're, you can drive 90 miles for, you can rent a car for a lot less than $1,000, and uh, most people, frankly, prefer not to go through a couple of changes from a feeder airline to a hub to another destination if you're able to avoid it. And an hour, uh, 45 minutes, or hour and a half air travel is certainly perfectly reasonable, especially when you consider, in addition, that if it really is essential, the Secretary of Transportation has the ability to, to waive this legislation, so uh, people are just unilaterally uh, assuming that somehow some terrible thing will happen when the authority already exists in the executive branch to prevent that from happen, happening. So to further hold the whole system uh, hostage, over a small effort to reform what really has been, I think, over a period of years, an accumulation of earmarks. People had the ability to provide for a subsidy for an airport in their district in this area or that area. They were in leadership on the committee or in the Congress, and we've, we've seen this pile up and pile up, and it's really about time it gets, gets addressed. Uh, and uh, asking people to uh, uh, find a way to get to an airport if it's uh, less than 90 miles that they have to find alternative transportation, rather than having the federal government subsidize it in a few airports around the country, uh, seems to me to be something that is badly in need of doing. It saves money for the taxpayer, not a whole lot, but I think the estimates are between uh, eight and nine million dollars a year. And I guess around here that doesn't amount to a whole lot, but in most communities and families and other areas, uh, that's a lot of money. And of course, we have to remember the federal government isn't the only government uh, concerned. If people really do want to subsidize service because of some local uh, need, uh, the, the community or the state or the county involved is certainly perfectly free to do that. So why we should be picking a couple dozen uh, communities around the entire United States and subsidizing to the extent of uh, over $1,000 per passenger uh, to provide this sort of almost air limousine service for a few individuals in, the, in these communities is beyond me. And yet if this is non-negotiable and we have to, and we can't concede to the language already in the Senate bill and we, we're going to have to shut down the whole system except for essential uh, air service because of trying to do this modest reform. After 23 extensions or 24 extensions, uh, we've really come to a pretty uh, kind of arbitrary and unreasonable place here in this house. So I'd urge my colleagues to support the rule and the underlying legislation. And I thank you for yielding. Gentleman from Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield three minutes to the distinguished gentlewoman from uh, Texas, my good friend, Ms. Jackson Lee. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman and I, I want to associate myself with his very uh, detailed and well stated uh, opening statement on this legislation. I think the premise should be that all of us agree in the importance of the FAA. I um, have served as the chairwoman of the Transportation Security Administration uh, Committee under the Department of Homeland Security, on the Homeland Security Committee, now serve as its ranking member. Through that time frame, I have uh, seen uh, the overlapping need to uh, view uh, particularly uh, FAA's work and particularly air traffic control at work uh, as part of both the safety and security of this nation. I remind uh, my colleagues of the uh, activist role that air traffic controllers in particular uh, took during 9-11. Uh, during the massiveness of confusion and the uh, loss of uh, the uh, destination or the placing of 
uh, three of our major uh, airlines and uh, planes that were flying in airplanes, the air traffic controller was uh, really a team that was on the first response, if you will. So their work uh, is enormously important. And my colleague mentioned some numbers that I think are in extremely important to $1.3 trillion is what we find as uh, the revenue in the airline industry, 11.5 million jobs, 75% uh, increase in employees within 20 years and $1 billion uh, in the next decade. Uh, I want to say that this means that we have a great obligation to protect the American traveling public. I also want to associate myself uh, with the idea of uh, not protecting our small airports uh, and uh, disadvantaging those airports by this legislation. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I assume uh, uh, Chairman Rockefeller's comments uh, play to that as well. But I had offered an amendment that was sent to the Senate to establish a mandate that the top 20 United States airports, there should be no fewer than three tra air traffic controllers on duty during periods of airfield operations. I firmly believe this provision will ensure that air traffic control towers at high volume airports in this country will be appropriately staffed at all times. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we engage with the conference committee uh, very diligently. We have heard, all heard the recent stories of air traffic controllers falling asleep, or being locked out of the control tower, or for whatever reason not being able to be on the job on duty at critical times. Now I know that air traffic controllers reflect the diversity of America and the various ills and concerns. We also know they have long concentrated hours and it's a difficult job. Just recently uh, there was a question of whether or not uh, an air traffic controller was inebriated on the job, whether he drank on the job, or he came to the job, uh, he or she uh, without, uh, with this uh, condition. But if that was the case and there was one air traffic controller there, there's zero. If that was the case and there were two, uh, then there was one. Can I get an additional? I yield the gentle lady an additional minute. I thank the gentleman. And I submit that by simply having a codified policy that at the busiest and most critical airports we mandate there be personnel redundancy in control towers, we can make the aviation system much safer and much more secure. The American passenger has value. Those dear souls who lost their lives on 9-11 when we were not exposed to this concept of terrorism had value. The American passenger is entitled to safety and security. Think about the people on planes flying across our country. They are our grandmothers, husbands, wives, babies, family members, business persons, associates, colleagues. They're American passengers and their lives have value. To ensure their safety and security, I believe we need more than what is presently moving in this bill that has not come to the floor, and I believe we should move on with the conference uh, conferees uh, to be appointed, uh, because as I said, I sent my language to the initial negotiations. We need to move on so there's an opportunity for us to work this idea, but this is more than a study. We don't need another study. We have already seen the mishaps. 9-11 discovered the value and importance of these uh, particular workers, and we now have discovered the problem. I ask my colleagues to uh, raise the question and to uh, question this rule and this bill or this extension uh, because we are putting our American passengers in jeopardy. With that, I yield back. Gentleman from Florida. Reserve my time. Gentleman reserve your time. Gentleman from Florida. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased at this time to yield to my very good friend from New Jersey four minutes uh, uh, to Mr. Andrews. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for four minutes. Without objection. I thank my friend for yielding. Uh, as we meet this afternoon to consider this very necessary legislation, too many Americans are looking at yet another Friday without a paycheck. Too many Americans are leery when they hear the phone ring for the fear it's another dunning phone call from a creditor they can't pay. Too many Americans are stuck for yet another week in a part-time job that doesn't come anywhere close to paying their family's bills. The country has a jobs crisis. We have the same number of private sector jobs in America that we had in 2001 today and we have 14% more people looking for work. We have a jobs crisis. This is the 196th day of the majority that now runs the House of Representatives. And on not one of those days has the majority taken advantage of the opportunity to come to the floor 
work together on legislation that would address this jobs crisis here in our country. I believe that resolving this crisis requires us to work together in three areas. First, we have to get our fiscal house in order as a government. We can no longer borrow 40 cents of every dollar that we spend. And we certainly cannot let this country fail to meet its obligation to pay its bills, a deadline that is on August 2nd. Failure to do that would mean more than simply failing our country's national obligations. It would mean higher mortgage rates. It would mean higher car loan rates, higher small business rates. And if we miss the deadline, it would mean not enough money to pay Social Security checks or our troops or our creditors. We cannot let that happen. Just across this Capitol, there are signs of hope where members of the other body from both political parties have begun to have a serious proposal put on the table that would significantly address our budget problem by reducing entitlement spending, which we must do, by reducing spending on regular government programs, which we must do, by reducing defending, uh, spending on defense in areas that would not weaken our country, which we must do, and yes, by requiring the very wealthiest and most successful of Americans to pay a bit more towards solving this problem. That is a fair and balanced way to approach this problem. I'm heartened by the fact that across the Capitol, both Republicans and Democrats are beginning to make that effort. We should make the same effort here, something we could agree to. Second, we've got to stimulate demand for businesses in this country. I think the main reason why so many employers are not hiring is they legitimately fear there won't be enough customers to buy their appliances or their antibiotics or their software, that there isn't enough demand in our economy. One of the reasons we don't have that demand is we send $1 billion a day to Middle Eastern countries who sell us oil. Why don't we keep that $1 billion here in the United States of America? and put it to work, putting Americans to work. Whether it's building windmill farms off the coast, or solar farms throughout our rural areas, or exploring regular conventional sources of energy in a safe and environmentally conscious way, let's do that. Why aren't we investing to give ourselves a continued lead in the biotechnology industry? As scientists are figuring out ways to grow new tissue that heals hearts and livers and kidneys? Why aren't we working to retain our leadership position in the world? I would ask for another minute. I yield the gentleman an additional I thank my friend. In order to create jobs here in our country. So these are ways that we could, we could and should work together. Why aren't we doing far more than we're doing this afternoon on this airport bill? You know, airport investment puts Americans to work and good air travel makes growth possible. But look at what we're doing. A temporary scanty uh, extension of our investment in our air traffic system because we can't get our fiscal house in order to agree to the kind of extension that we need. 196 days of missed opportunity. Let's not make tomorrow the 197th day of missed opportunity. Let's come together, work together as Republicans and Democrats, and create an environment where entrepreneurs can begin to create the jobs that we so desperately need here in our country. Yes, we have a deficit in America. It is a very serious deficit. But the most serious deficit we have is a jobs deficit. And until we can find a way to put 15 million unemployed Americans back to work, our deficits will continue. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just say I want to remind the people that are, might be watching this that we're talking about a House Resolution 357, which is a rule that would allow us to reauthorize uh, a, uh, an extension of the Airport Airway Extension Act, which is called H.R. 2553. That's our discussion. That's what we're talking about. And I uh, reserve my time. Joe, Florida? I'll ask my good friend from Florida whether he has any other speakers. I'm prepared to close. No, I'm ready to close. And I'll, I'm prepared to close. Gentlemen, Florida. In so doing, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, 
uh, having now fully read uh, Senator Rockefeller's uh, letter, I do ask uh, uh, that uh, unanimous consent that Senator Rockefeller's letter to Chairman Micah dated July 19th be made a part of the record. Without objection. Thank you. And I will read only four sentences from it. He says to Chairman Micah, I strongly urge you to reconsider your position and send over a clean FAA extension and appoint conferees for the FAA reauthorization bill as the Senate did on April 7, 2011, to move this important legislation forward. Further efforts to add policy components to FAA extensions that have been negotiated with the Senate will likely shut the FAA down. Um, as Transportation Secretary LaHood and FAA Administrator Babbitt have said, the United States faces a pivotal time in aviation history. In order to ensure the safety of the flying public and bring our air transportation system into the 21st century, the FAA needs a long-term reauthorization bill. While H.R. 2553 buys us a little more time, we cannot afford to continue ignoring the underlying problem. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I try very much uh, to not be as parochial uh, as uh, I can be on many instances. But in West Palm Beach, we are building a new airport um, um, uh, tower, and we need the next-gen facilities. At the Fort Lauderdale Airport, that is uh, my hometown uh, airport, um, uh, we are expanding uh, the runway. And it becomes increasingly difficult to complete the projects when money uh, for doing so comes in increments um, uh, rather than in a block that will allow that they go forward in a meaningful way. Uh, toward that end, failure to enact a multi-year FAA reauthorization is just going to re result in delays to much-needed infrastructure improvements, um, including, as I have mentioned, the ground-based and next-gen technologies, and ultimately cost our nation more in the long run with regard to passenger safety, jobs, and the environment. Enough is enough. We need a clean extension now in order to pass a long-term authorization as soon as possible. And I urge my colleagues to vote no on the rule and the underlying bill. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to address uh, one thing about the uh, change that's in this particular reauthorization, the Essential Air Service, uh, which has basically become the the uh, uh, government-funded corporate jet program, and we've tried to reduce that. I mean, so if you're a businessman, you live in a rural community, instead of being willing to drive an hour and a half to get on a plane at a hub, a medium or a large size hub, you're willing to have the government fund your, your airplane for you. So it's basically a corporate member, somebody that has a business there, they get on a jet and to the tune of 30, 30, up to $3,720, we, we subsidize that. The taxpayers of this country subsidize that. So it's like a subsidized corporate jet. And it's, uh, it's a sad thing. We want to reduce that. Uh, we'd like to get it, do away with it. A lot of us would like to do away with it altogether, but it would reduce that down to $1,000 instead of having to drive maybe an hour and a half to an airport. Uh, it's a sad thing. However, I, another sad thing is we're here. I, I am sad about the fact that we're standing here on the floor once again to vote for another extension. I wish it had worked out. I wish we could get together. I, uh, and I hope that happens in the next few weeks if we approve this. This extension is necessary to ensure continued safety on all who fly, uh, be it for business or pleasure or any other reason in American skies. Uh, I ask my colleagues to join today and, and vote in favor of this rule and passage of the underlying bill. I yield back the balance of my time and I move the previous question on the record. Gentleman resolution. yields back the balance of his time. All time for the debate on the resolution has expired. The question is on order the previous question on the resolution. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Opinion Chair, the aye had it. Speaker. Gentleman from Florida. 
Uh, I'd uh, like to request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having arisen. The yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the Chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote on the question of adoption. This is a 15-minute vote. The House conducting its first uh, series of votes for the day, members extension of federal aviation administration programs. Current extension stretches until this Friday. The extension the House is voting on would continue until September 16th. In the meantime, House and Senate negotiators continue to work to resolve differences in the underlying bill to produce a longer-term measure. The Senate, in the meantime, is working on their own version of the bill. Again, this is a vote on the rule for debating the measure, calling for one hour equally divided. General debate expected to follow. Members hoping to wrap up work on this before it runs out on Friday. This is a 15-minute vote. 